afternoon. On behalf of the National Park Service and the Friends of Flight 93 National Memorial, I would like to welcome you to today's program. My name is Donna Gibson and I am the president of the Friends Board of Directors. The Friends are the philanthropic partner to this memorial. We work with the National Park Service, the National Park Foundation, and the families of Flight 93 to raise funds to make sure that this memorial maintains its relevancy for generations to come. We raise funds to be used for educating school students, building trails, supporting our Junior Ranger program, and many other programs and projects designed to enhance your experience while visiting our memorial. One of the many programs we sponsor is the Summer Speaker Series. We invite family members and other individuals who have had a unique connection to the memorial to share their stories with our visitors. Today our guest is Paul McNulty and Tom McMillan. Paul is now the president of his alma mater, Grove City College. Three days after the terror attacks devastated our nation, Paul was confirmed as U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia. This assignment put him in a position to oversee the prosecution of Zacharias Massawi, known as the 9-11 attacks 12th hijacker. Today, Paul will share his unique experience with the terrorist attacks with Tom McMillan. Tom is on the Friends Board of Directors. He's also an ambassador and VIP for this memorial and has authored the book, Flight 93, which is available in our bookstore. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you, Donna, and uh, I'm, I'm Tom. And I can't remember in our three years we had to scramble for the last five minutes to put chairs in here because there were so many people. So Paul, you're, you've drawn quite a, quite a crowd. Really excited to have uh, Paul here uh, because he was, his, his, with his role as Donna mentioned, he was uh, on September 11th the number three person in the Justice Department. He was Associate Deputy Attorney General. And as she mentioned, three days later he was named U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District. So he was really in charge of of the first trial that really of a terrorist co-conspirator that might have been involved on the fringes of this case and it, it's the case where we found and where they made public much of the evidence and much of the story that we know of September 11th and, and Flight 93. So Paul, we're really uh, really excited to have you. Now, the, the one thing that had got me though when we spoke on the phone is for all your work, you'd never been to the memorial. No. 10 yeah, o'clock this morning yeah. was the first time. Can you That's just right. bring, it, bring us back to that? Yeah, thank yeah, you, Tom. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the invitation and uh, the hospitality I've experienced so far from your members of the board and uh, the um, ambassadors and uh, park service folks. It's been wonderful. I have to be honest and say that um, over the last uh, 18 years, um, my wife and I and my family, we lived in Washington, D.C. for 30 years. Um, before I returned to Western Pennsylvania. I grew up in Pittsburgh um, to become the president of Grove City College five years ago. So we have um, driven back and forth on the turnpike way beyond what we could ever count. We had two daughters that went to the college. There was a part of me that was actually holding back from coming because it had been such an emotional experience being a part of the prosecution and getting to know the families and it was a five-year process of prosecuting Sakaris Masawi. And I knew that when I did it, I wanted to do it in a way where I had the time to kind of process it and work through the emotions and so forth. And we were always back and forth kind of on a trip. And so I thought, well, that day will come. And that day just kept not coming. And uh, so today is, it's come. And, uh, and I'm so thankful that it, that it has. And the first thing that I was struck by as I pulled in and I hadn't even appreciated how beautiful the site was going to be. Part of me, I think, was expecting it to be like it was as a crime scene, what we knew it to be when, when the attacks occurred, and my team was coming back and forth here. Um, uh, those of us who were close, and I'm, all of us have this memory of the day 18, nearly 18 years ago, but for all those who are, have some particular connection, it's always the weather that we remember because it was such a beautiful day. And, and in Washington, D.C., you get some really hot days in early September and you don't want to be outside. And it was a gorgeous, cooler, blue sky morning. And so when I pulled in here this morning, sure enough, it was a beautiful day and I felt the flood of the emotions beginning to return. 
Now back to that day, as you mentioned, we all, all those who are alive have a memory of where we were. Visitors often will volunteer that information. Your day must have been unique though. Can you take us through that day? Sure. You're, you're going to work before this all happens and how right. the country changed and your life changed. Yeah. Well, as you mentioned, um, I was working in the Justice Department. So we were nine months into the new administration of George W. Bush. Um, and I had been nominated to be the U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District of Virginia. So I was going to be the Chief Federal Prosecutor for one of the 94 federal districts of the United States. And Eastern Virginia is everything from Northern Virginia down to Richmond and then down to the Tidewater. And that was, um, my name had been put forward, but in all new administrations, there's a slow process of confirmations that have to occur. And so I was still at the main justice, we call it, the building on Pennsylvania Avenue and Constitution Avenue that sits there across the street from the FBI. Um, and I was um, the principal associate deputy attorney general, which means that you had the attorney general, John Ashcroft, and you had the deputy attorney general, um, Larry Thompson, and then he had someone who was his uh, top associate to help the deputy run the department. The deputy is the sort of uh, chief operating officer of, of DOJ. I actually end up becoming the deputy um, right after this 9-11 case in 2005. I became the deputy attorney general. But at that point, I was Larry Thompson's uh, principal associate. So he and I shared a suite together on the fourth floor of the Department of Justice. and. Um, we were parking, uh, there was some construction going on in the building, and so we were parking, I parked across the street at, next to the FBI, and as I was pulling into the garage, the first plane hit World Trade Center, and, and that was being reported on the news. And at that moment, I thought that some pilot had done a horrible thing, and that we had a, a, a bizarre aviation problem. And, and by the time I got into the office and walked into the Deputy Attorney General Larry Thompson's office, Larry was sitting at his desk and learning about the second plane. And he and I looked at each other and we realized something's going on here and the country is under attack. And the, the Department of Justice is about seven floors with hundreds of employees. And he and I realized at that moment that we needed to make immediate decisions about the potential safety of our employees and we had no idea the scope of what was going on at that point. Um, the Pentagon had not yet been hit but it was going to be happening in minutes after we began to think this through. And then rumors, we started getting phone calls about rumors that the White House has been hit, the State Department's been hit, we didn't know what was going on. Um, now Attorney General Ashcroft was actually not in town because remember where President Bush was? He was in Tampa reading to school children, that famous scene of his chief of staff whispering in, his, whispering in his ear and telling him that the country was under attack. Well, John Ashcroft, the attorney general, was doing the same thing. It was education day for the cabinet and they were all spread out around the country and they were promoting educational themes and John Ashcroft was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin doing a similar thing. And so he got word in Milwaukee and he had to be escorted back in the FBI plane that um, he flew out in by fighter jets to come back into the Washington airspace. And Larry Thompson, the Deputy Attorney General, was immediately notified that he needed to be removed from the department because we needed to set up an alternative site for operations of the U.S. government. Now, imagine that, that we have contingency plans for continuity of government, that if Washington is under attack, we can run the country from a remote location. And we put those plans into action and Larry Thompson was off to a, a, an alternative site from downtown Washington, which left me still there. <laughs> and I started to worry about that a little bit. Um, and I'm sorry it takes so long, but I'll just finish no, with this and me? say, um, the command center for the Department of Justice is on the top floor. And the first thing we had to do was empty the building. And this was a 1930s vintage building, so it wasn't like you just uh, blow into some kind of um, announcer system. We had to send people around office by office, floor by floor, and tell them to leave the building. So in case any plane was headed towards the Department of Justice, um, we would protect them. And then um, some of us, a small group of us, um, went to the command center on the seventh floor, and I was the senior person at that point, and I was 
in a sense, overseeing the command center coordination efforts. And, and, and what that meant was we had, and you can maybe picture a room with lots of computer terminals and big TV screens, and, and, and we were just trying to understand what was happening, get information, and coordinate among all the different agencies that were then represented in that room. And um, that was going on throughout the morning. And so I watched the towers come down, sitting in the command center, looking up at gigantic screens. And that's how I you know, came to see, just the way all of you watched it on television. I was watching on the big screens in the command center. I had to also add that um, it, we didn't know where Flight 93 was for about um, 30 minutes or so of this time, so maybe even 45 minutes. So we were still trying to figure out one plane that was unaccounted for. We knew it was hijacked, but we didn't know where it was going, what was, where it was headed. And we knew at least that it was headed towards DC. We knew at that point the Pentagon had been hit, of course. And up until this point in time, the Department of Justice had been prosecuting various cases, and one of them was in the 1990s, a case called the Blind Sheik, and he tried, he was part of a conspiracy to blow up the World Trade Center earlier. And we knew that Al-Qaeda was, used that as a rallying point for its future efforts, and so it occurred to me that the plane could be heading to the Department of Justice. And um, I was sitting on the seventh floor, and um, it was one of those moments that every now and then you have one where you can realize that maybe your life is about to end and um, you do a little bit of a check on whether or not you're at peace. And um, I'll save you the details and just say I felt at peace. But, um, but still, uh, we, we were waiting to hear what happened. And then finally, Attorney General Ashcroft gets to D.C. by um, later that morning. And he doesn't come to the command center at our building. Instead, Bob Mueller, now history is just too rich here, right? <laughs> Robert Mueller is the director of the FBI and he's been on the job for one week. I actually was uh, his assistant in getting him co confirmed by the Senate earlier that summer. And in August, uh, he um, is um, preparing to begin his new job at the start of September. And so he's across the street in the FBI's SIOC, their Strategic Information Operations Center. And he's standing up a similar kind of all agency coordinating investigative team. <laughs> and John Ashcroft gets to DC and he realizes that's where I want to be, not where you are, Paul. I want to go be with the big guys over the FBI. So we have to cross the street and join him over at the SIOC. And that's where I end up spending the next several days at the Strategic Information and Operations Center at the FBI with the Attorney General. And now Deputy Attorney General Thompson has returned, and so in the afternoon, we are now standing up our you know, global investigation out of the FBI's headquarters. Uh, as for the Masawi trial, can you just give us a little run through on who was Masawi? People have heard his name, but not a lot of people are into yeah. the weeds in the story, and, and why that trial was important. Yeah. Before that, can I just um, mention one thing that introduces why I was again <coughs> doing Masawi. Um, so, what, so we, we were there that afternoon and um, we were there until late to the night and we were, again, it's the Director of FBI, Bob Mueller, Attorney General Ashcroft, uh, Deputy Attorney General Thompson, myself and, and, and s several others of us in a sort of a small conference room getting all this information from um, all these sources and, and trying to assess what's going on. And the FBI beginning to um, both prevent another attack, but also investigate what uh, has occurred. And we break finally about after midnight, 12.30 or so. And I live in Fairfax, Virginia, and I head straight down past the Pentagon to go home. And so I get back to that car that I had parked at, you know, 8.30, and um, it's now maybe 12.30, 1 o'clock, and I'm driving past the Pentagon. And if you've ever been there on 395, and there's the Pentagon, the site that was hit is right there next to the highway. And D.C. is, of course, completely shut down. And I pull over, and I look over, and I just see the Pentagon in flames, 
and the emotions of that day just let out. And I just sat there in my car for about 15 minutes and just cried because our lives, I knew, had changed for forever. Um, well, two days later, Senator, uh, no, that, that next day, Senator Leahy, who's the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, at that time the Democrats were in charge of the Senate, um, called John Ashcroft in that conference room area where we were, and he said, um, General, how can I be of help? By the way, it's nice to know that there are bipartisan moments when we have times of great need. And uh, Senator Leahy said, General, how can I help? And John Ashcroft began to name some things that we would need Congress to do for DOJ. And he said, I, it would be great if you could confirm our U.S. Attorney nominees who are going to be involved in this. Including, by the way, Mary Beth Buchanan, who was nominated to be the U.S. Attorney in the Western District of Pennsylvania. And that would include this area. So the Senate moved my name in the next 48 hours, and I was confirmed within three days, which otherwise might have taken another month or two or whatever. And therefore, I was able to immediately go down to Virginia and start to oversee the efforts in that U.S. Attorney's Office. And because the Pentagon is in that district, we were a bit of a command center of our own, doing subpoenas and doing legal support for now this global investigation. And I remember going to the Pentagon uh, after I arrived. And at the very moment I I was there visiting and, and getting in, briefed in by the FBI and others about the, uh, where things were on the, on the rescue recovery process. They had just discovered film from a camera that was outside the Pentagon wall, and they were watching that film for the first time in their little trailer at the FBI that set up, and we saw the plane coming and hitting the outer wall, and so I could see the nose of the plane in this film just before it hit the wall, which was very moving. Um, a month or so later, now I'm finding your question, I'm told that I knew that day that we had arrested this fellow in Minnesota named Zacharias Masawi, and he had been up to um, some bizarre things trying to learn how to fly a 747 on a flight simulator at, at, uh, in, in Minnesota, and um, red flags galore about what he was up to. And he had been arrested because he was um, here in the country illegally. And so he was being held he lied to the FBI agent in, in uh, Minnesota as to why he was here. And then we learn about this fellow who's been arrested. And then I learn now that he's going to be brought to Eastern Virginia. And that's where he's going to um, stand trial. And what that ended up becoming within the next month or two is the entire 9-11 attack case because we charged him as a co-conspirator for everything that occurred that day. And, and it became the focal point of the investigation of the events of 9-11. Now, as Donna mentioned earlier, for a long time he was uh, described in the media, and maybe by others, as the 20th hijacker, mm -hmm. which would have meant that that theory was that he would have been targeted to be on Flight 93, because mm -hmm. it had the smallest right. group. They, there were five hijackers, and all the other flights were only four here. So that right. was the original thought. Turned out, I wanted you to explain this, but that that wasn't the case, but he was practicing to be a pilot. And that one theory was that perhaps if the, pi the hijacker pilot of Flight 93, the uh, Jara, they were worried about him backing off, mm -hmm. perhaps backing out perhaps at the very end, that Masawi was uh, training to be a pilot to perhaps be a replacement. I mean, those, that's a lot of theory there, but right. ties him into possibilities of, of this story here and what some people may have heard. That's right. Um, We'll, we'll never know for sure what um, would have happened if Masawi hadn't been arrested. Um, there are um, a few possibilities. One is that uh, there may have been an effort to assemble a crew in short notice because he was arrested on August 16th. So uh, although the date and time uh, for the attacks on 9-11 were actually set very late, uh, just a week or so or less before the actual day of the attack. So there was some uncertainty about when the attack would go forward. But uh, others who might have joined him in forming a fifth plane crew did not enter successfully, and so that's one possibility, one that he actually testified to when, he, when we held a trial. By the way, this took a long time. 
and I don't have time today to explain how the case drags out like that for four years, but it was a very complicated case legally involving lots of classified information and how you use classified information in a prosecution is really complicated. So we didn't actually have the trial for this, um, the guilt, um, it was mostly a trial about his punishment, whether or not he would be executed or not. He was pled guilty uh, to the basic charges in 05, but there was a trial for his punishment in a sense in 06, the spring of 06. So four and a half years later, we were actually um, uh, having the trial. At that point, he testified. And um, he said that he was <laughs> going to be on, on a fifth plane and that he was going to, his target was going to be the White House. And that has some interesting relevance to, to, to this site. I'll get back to that in a bit about, the, about Washington, D.C. and targets. Um, but um, it, there's also this theory of a second wave of planes that could have occurred at another time. Uh, and as you say, somebody who maybe is in the bullpen who could have been pulled out. We'll, we'll never know the answer to that. But he was definitely someone who trained. He's a French citizen born in Morocco who trained uh, in Afghanistan. He was um, um, personally re um, um, you know, designated as an um, operative by Osama bin Laden himself. Um, he swore allegiance to bin Laden and to Al Qaeda. Uh, he came into our country with the intention of committing a terrorist act. He received funds to do that from the same individual who sent the funds to the other hijackers. Uh, the, the, our case is filled with all the evidence that ties him to the, um, uh, the, the other 19 hijackers and the conspiracy. And the jury in Alexandria actually found that he was responsible for the deaths on 9-11. The question the jury had to decide was whether or not he should be um, receive the death penalty for that. And that was what the, um, the jury ultimately voted 11 to 1 to uh, impose the death penalty. It takes 12 votes. It takes a unanimous decision. So he was spared the death penalty. And he's now serving a life sentence in a maximum security prison. Um, but uh, he was definitely groomed for uh, participation in some fashion. As you go into this, were you surprised at the intricacies of their planning for this day with all that, with all that you and your staff would have gone through? Um, I guess we were d definitely struck by it. Um, we, we could have understood ahead of time, and, and it was confirmed by the investigation, that it would take a lot of sophistication and preparation and to pull it off. So in that sense, um, those discoveries were, were um, somewhat expected that, it, that concealing identity and, and, and um, um, timing of flights and so forth would, would all be a part of it. I think what you really need to appreciate is that in the summer of 01, we were at high alert as a law enforcement community, as an intelligence community, as a government, we were at high alert in relation to a terrorist attack. The FBI was very much concerned about this. In fact, as, as President Bush took office in January, nine months earlier, I was responsible for the transition of the Department of Justice from the Clinton administration to the Bush administration. I had to interview all the senior people who were going to be now part of the new Bush team, and that included Louis Free, who was the FBI director at that point. And I remember sitting in his office and asking him, what are the things we need to care about the most right now? And without question, top of the list, terrorism. And, um, and, and specifically, um, Islamic extremism and how that might um, threaten us. And so we knew that. But, but up until that point, the targets had been outside the United States for the most part. We did have the blind sheet case, but we had the embassies in Africa. And, and so we had kind of a global alert. Um, but that's why Massawi's information was so vital and would have made such a difference, because it would have alerted the FBI and the FAA to what was going to be happening in our country, and um, and that that was a big difference. Now, bringing it back to this site, you were here for the first time. I here did some tours with some rangers. Can you bring it back with your perspective, which is very unique, on 
your feeling on what happened here and the importance of what happened here and what the people in that plane did? Yeah. So all of us in this room today, in my opinion, need to leave here with one thought that dominates our thinking tonight and into the tomorrow and so forth. And if you haven't had this thought, um, I encourage you to have it and probably many of you have already. What happened right here cannot be fully appreciated in terms of the historic significance. And, and the heroism that occurred within about 15 minutes is as heroic as anything that you'll learn about. Because that plane was headed to Washington. Was it headed to the Capitol? Probably. It might have been headed to the White House. The White House is a hard target to hit. The dome of the Capitol would not have been. Now remember, the World Trade Center, symbol of commerce and American commercial strength. The Pentagon, symbol of America's military strength. The Capitol Dome, the symbol of America's democracy. What symbol, more than the Capitol Dome, do we think of when it comes to the democratic process? And the Capitol, by the way, was fully occupied. Congress was in session. Had that plane reached Washington and crashed into the dome, the blow to America's psyche, the, the, the impact that would have had on us as a nation is beyond our imagination. We would still have responded with the kind of incredible um, um, determination and commitment that we did, but it would have been um, another degree of, um, of harm to our, uh, our country. And th those passengers sensed that. Because what they learned, you remember when they, I'm sorry to go on too long about no, this, <laughs> but when, remember they learned slowly what was happening. But at first they were told by the, um, the, the hijacker who had taken over, I'm, you know, this is your captain, stay in your seats, we're going to, this is a, you know, we're going to go uh, and land this plane somewhere, and this is a hijacking, like a traditional hijacking. So when you when you listen to the phone calls of the family uh, of the of the passengers or family members, you know what there's what you what you pick up is this growing sense that this is not going to end well. That at first we've been hijacked. There's a fellow with a bomb strapped around his waist. Um, they say there are three of them because they can't quite see in many cases what's going on, and you know, they're not sure how this is going to end. That's 9.30. But by 9, 9.38, 9.40, they're starting to realize that as they learn about the World Trade Center from their relatives, their, friend, their, their family members they're talking to, this plane is going to be flown into some place. This is, this is a suicide mission. And it's that point, we'll, we'll never know for sure, but the deliberations that go on for the next 15 minutes, I think involve self-sacrifice to the utmost. I think they involve individuals saying, we've got to take this plane down before it kills our fellow citizens. <coughs> now, could they have landed it, tried to do something? Yes, I'm not dismissing that that is, a, is also on their mind. But especially as the clock gets closer to 10, and now they're, they've successfully stormed the cockpit at that point, it, when, you, when you hear the, 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 the voices of the, of the hijackers and so forth, you, you hear the struggle, you have every reason to see that they're now determined to um, protect others and, and bring the plane down, or at least not to let the hijackers succeed. The hijacker is thinking, well, if this is over, we're going to bring this plane down because that's our instruction as well. But, 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 but if they had sat passively in their seats thinking, well, maybe we're going to do something different, history would have gone in such a different direction. And so what I was struck by today was the power of that heroism, the, the providence, the providence of the plane being delayed. Remember, the flight was supposed to take off at 8 o'clock. And it didn't take off till 8.42. If it had taken off on time, then they would not have known that the World Trade Centers had been hit. 
and then the flight might have continued on its path right into the capital. But instead, the flight was delayed by 45 minutes. It gave them time to learn that and to make that, um, those incredible decisions that they were making. Um, and even the, even the passengers, they were an especially able group of people that gets into a lot of the details that we learned about each of them. But people who had um, some real capability to try to affect what was going on. We have time for a few questions. Everybody has one from the audience for Paul. Rare opportunity. Yes, sir. Do you know what, what time, point the timeline, the military picked up the building or set the flight line? Did you hear the question? Time was uh, there was a there was a timeline for picking up uh, the military picking up flight ninety three. Well, to be honest with you, I'm not going to remember that very well. Have you been over to that one panel yet in the museum? that has the flight, that will help because it actually has the markers of where we knew certain things along that flight path. And, um, and I think there's a reference there, isn't there, to, a, to the military's... Um, um, right, right, and when they become aware and, and, and so I, I have to defer to that in terms of those times. It's all compressed, of course, within a, a roughly um, a 45 minute, well, no, um, 9.28, to 10.03, um, so it's 30 minutes, yeah. Yes, ma'am. What do we know about the, the flight 77? You know, when I mentioned a moment ago about the fact that the flight was delayed here and it gave the passengers time to have phone calls, their air phone system, um, and to use that air phone system to be able to talk to some people and learn about what was happening, Flight 77 was ahead of that. So Flight 77 ran, uh, crashed into the Pentagon around 9, 9.37. So, so those folks had taken off from Dulles Airport, Dulles. They had gone west. The hijacking occurs. They come back to DC. Correct me if I'm wrong, Robert. I th there were some calls from that flight as well? Yes, there were at least two. There were at least two, right. Flight 77 took off at 8.19. And basically, it did drop off the radar, and they lost track of it. But then it's going to come back, and it'll impact that Pentagon at 9:37. By the way, you know, there's the victims of all of these things, and I, I was reminded this morning that um, because of what happened here, we don't use that language. We talk about the passengers and their families because they were proactive. But as a prosecutor, we dealt with. Um, thousands of victims' families. And, and, and what I don't have time to go into much today is the incredible effort by my office and the New York City U.S. Attorney's Office, led by Jim Comey, by the way. He was U.S. Attorney in New York. Uh, he and I teamed up together to organize the investigation and the um, prosecution. He sent folks down to Alexandria to be a part of our team. Um, uh, the effort to interview the families was a critical part of the prosecution because it gave families a chance to talk about their loved ones and have a process that they could um, engage with. And, and so on Flight 77, because it made this unusual and incredible turn and 180 degrees, well, actually, a full circle, came back and hit the Pentagon after coming towards, um, you say Reagan National, I mean a complete loop and back and hit the Pentagon that way. There are, you know, thousands of people who were in Crystal City and so forth who saw this plane do that right before their eyes. And it just underscores the, um, the impact something like this has on other people. And I think obviously we try to tell a little general story of September 11th, but this is mostly Flight 93. There is a memorial at the Pentagon, but there have been a couple of books written about it. They're in, they're in the bookstore too. So, one time, probably time for one more. Yeah, how did the FBI know that Masawi was involved in this specific attack? They knew he was a bad guy, but uh -huh. how, did, how did they tie to the planning of this specific? Well, I want to make sure that I'm clear about it. Our case was not that Masawi was planning the attacks of 9-11. Our case was about him being a co-conspirator, which means someone who has an involvement with 
a conspiracy to commit a crime. Okay. And, and his involvement is very limited because he is um, training but yet not assigned to any particular um, attack. And our case was that he knew the sort of infrastructure of the uh, um, planning because he had contacts for purposes of his money support and um, and other direction he received that had he honestly answered and not lied about his purposes in August, the FBI would have been able to quite easily follow up on the leads he provided and prevent all or some of what occurred the following month. That was our case. And the jury accepted that case as being fair enough. And then the question was, what should the penalty be for that case? So it wasn't that he was like <laughs> Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and tied into the whole planning process. There, were only, there was only one Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. There was only one sort of mastermind of that nature. And, uh, and then Atta was another uh, large player of, of the um, 19. No, he, he was just someone, though, who had an involvement in the overall uh, conspiracy. Okay? Okay, Wes, I lied. One okay. <laughs> did, um, Paul, did you have a chance to talk one on one with the Saudi? And if so, what was that like? Well, actually, my team of, we had three prosecutors who dealt with him. My way of engaging with him was all through them. So, what was he like? Um, uh, he was a, um, a determined, he is a determined, I mean, he's still alive here, but he, he expressed his determination, his lack of remorse was extraordinary. He essentially mocked the family members who testified in uh, April of 06 and wished, and he said this to open court, wished that the attack had been on 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 that it never stopped and and there wasn't an ounce of regret in fact just the opposite he said that he enjoyed hearing the expression of their pain and difficulty and and he was a belligerent and obstinate all through the process uh, that's well documented in the way in which he appeared in court he gave his own defense lawyers a terrible time and um, um, and so uh, he confirmed every um, every uh, theory we had about him in terms of what he was all about by his own words and behavior throughout the process. So that will end our formal program. Today we'll be around, I'm sure, to discuss. Thank you so much for coming on behalf of the Friends of Flight 93. Thank you, Paul.